If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. Ready to go. Uh, but so, okay, uh, we've got a few people coming in. Uh, probably a few people now. Uh, just to get your, uh, get your questions coming in, uh, guys, because uh, Roger's a fascinating character and he's had a great career. He was an instructor on the Hawk, if I'm correct. Is that uh, I'm correct in saying that? That's and he's right, obviously yeah, yeah. Uh, a Typhoon pilot and he was on Six Squadron and Two Squadron and has had a, a fantastic career. So I'm sure many questions for you guys to ask about that. And he's also a massive uh, mental health advocate and uh, he does some tremendous work. So, yeah, we're going to have a bit about a chat about that, Rog. So, yeah, let's talk about um, how, how did that start for you? Like, how did you get into that kind of world? Into the world of mental health, well, to be honest, I think like anybody where, the, you know, these things catch you off guard and I didn't really know what mental health was all about. Um, you, you've heard me say this before where I, I found myself um, and it, it all stems from a horrible event um, back in 2010 where I lost a, a really close family member to suicide. and that moment as you can imagine completely rocked my world and um made me look at things and life um in a completely different perspective because of the because of everything that happened and um you know what i then had to deal with and my family had to deal with to to move through it and to to move through the grief um and i really really felt the stigma attached to mental health and you, I'll give you some reasons why, um, because I think you know it, you hear that a lot these days in the the stigma surrounding mental health, and you know mental health is almost a bit like a, a brand for some people, but it's it's only when you start to truly understand you know what mental health is, I think that's when you can then move forward, and um, but. You know, I don't wish it on anyone to have to go through the experiences uh, I did, my family did, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, I, I know how I was before and then how I was after and before. I just I didn't really understand it. You know, I, I knew that mental health was important um, because I knew that from my skiing world, from being a, a British ski team athlete, downhiller, and from that and trying to get the most out of in my head, you know, because I knew how important that was. But mental health and you know, mental illness and and what that was all about and the the um, the importance of communicating. That's what I really started to discover, you know, on my journey after that point. So I really felt the stigma to the point where I I couldn't even tell my housemates that I was living with a couple of other pilots. Um, you know, I was close to them, and it wasn't as if I was embarrassed about what happened um, it was just that I didn't know what to say I didn't know the language I didn't know how to talk about it I think I was almost scared of talking about it and that just carried on for a while you know there's some people I, I could obviously open up to uh, but there's a lot of people that um, I, I couldn't uh, talk to about it so that I endured that probably for a couple of months and then I decided right enough's enough I, I felt this like burden on, on my shoulders this weight of it almost like felt like I was living a lie. So I decided I had to do something about it. And um, initially, because I was a, a hawk instructor, as you say, a, a QFI at the time, um, I had some wonderful opportunities where I could sit in the back of the cockpit with a camera and get some cool shots. So I thought, right, I'm going to sell my photos for charity and then use it as a as a trampoline, as a springboard to... Um, to get my message out there um, and actually tell the world what happened. Um, I got the consent of my sisters and my dad, you know, the, um, my loved ones around me to make sure that they were okay with what I was doing. And, um, uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so glad that I, I made the jump because it was, you know, it's almost like wearing your heart on your sleeve and saying, right, this happens to me because of is affecting me as well and my family but it 
it felt like the right thing to do. And now, wherever that is, nearly 10 years. In fact, yeah, it is. It's 10 years uh, now yeah. on and a, a decade of mental health campaigning. And, you know, the, I mean, it's been a journey. I've raised over £20,000 for a charity now, for wow. mental health charities. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, I can't even believe that's happened. Um, and the amount of feedback, uh, the positive feedback that I've got from people who are so glad that I have got my head above the parapet and, and said what's happened. And because all, you know, all I want to do is help people. And I realized at the time is when um, everything happened, then the one thing that really helped me was listening or reading other people's experiences. So my, um, my well, now wife, she was so helpful and, and is my rock and has endured you know, everything I've gone through this, this journey. She, um, you know, she's the person who actually probably needs the most credit out of all of us because she's had to deal with my ups and downs the whole yeah. time. Um, and she was the one who got me to look at different uh, yeah, experiences from people and, and that really helped because it just felt like the most alien thing at the time and, you know, just not normal. Why, why, would, why would you do that? And, you know, all, all these sort of questions and to then listen to someone else who, uh, or, you know, to read someone else's story, it, it really helped. So that's then why a few years later, um, must have been 2016, I think, um, just before I had my first interview with yourself, Mike. Yeah. Um, that's when we decided to go ahead and raise and, and release our book, Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, just purely so we could get, uh, you know, the experience out there. You know, so it's not just a book, it's a book about my experiences, some of the good, and but then some of the bad and the ugly, but then how I got over that, almost like a self-help book, trying to, um, you know, get people thinking about mental health uh, predominantly. So, uh, and we've had some great feedback. Absolutely, and I love to read. Uh, I think I picked up my copy. Yeah, we just uh, when we had the interview. But uh, tell us some of the charities you work with, there, uh, Rog. Yeah, so over the years now, I've um, been fundraising for a couple of different charities. So I started off with uh, Sam H, Scott Association of Mental Health, um, and um, uh, Help for Heroes as well. So they do a lot of, of work, obviously, for mental health, obviously with Sam H, but um, a Help for Heroes as well. And then more recently, I've gone, um, it, what was actually 2018, I think, a change to Heads Together, because <clears throat> I'd met Prince William a couple of times. Um, and, and actually, um, most importantly, listening to his interviews and what he was saying about mental health. Um, really sparked, you know, something in me going, that's exactly, I, I totally get what he's saying. And I think with some connections to his mom and, you know, what's happened and his, how it's affected his mental health, I think, you know, there's some similarities there. And um, I find myself being drawn to his work. And because I met him a couple of times, found that he was a totally down to earth guy. And I, I'm a big fan. And so I thought this is perfect. And Heads Together are great because they're an umbrella to lots of other charities. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I say for people, if, if they need help or support, then actually if you go to the Heads Together page uh, on the net and then cl and simply click on Get Support, and then you'll see they've got all sorts of, of different charity partners and Shout, which is a text service yeah. if you need immediate support. Yeah. Or they can, or they will direct you to the Samaritans. If, if Samaritans, if you need something urgent, you know. So it's it's very good, very well thought out, and, and very clear. And I'm a big fan. And then um, more recently, as we we're talking about before this, um, I did a couple of uh, crazy charity cycles. Uh, so one was back in August last year. That was uh, coast to coast. So we actually raised a whole bunch of money for Heads Together. Uh, so that so it was the Scottish coast to coast. It was 180 miles. Um, over a few days, that was quite an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, actually, more recently, um, under good old lockdown, um, to uh, to deal with my um, my own mental health, because actually that's probably the reason, one of the reasons why I do it, um, but also to raise awareness of the NHS. So we raised um, money for uh, the NHS charities by doing a 12-hour uh, non-stop. I did get off the bike for two minutes for a week, and it was just two minutes. <laughs> 
from uh, that was 12 hours where I um I forgot I forgotten the, the number of miles uh, I cycled. I think it was 100. In fact, yeah, it was just more than I did for the coast to coast. I think it was like 178 miles uh, for that one. And then we actually did another one. I don't know if you saw it. We did um, a 24 hour. Um, so because of the um, the the VE Day Victory in Europe Day 75, so the 75th anniversary of that momentous uh, uh, occasion then myself and a, and a good friend Nathan Jones um, we decided to raise money for a few different charities um, um, to and we, we did 24 hours with 75 minutes on 45 minutes off um, and that was I was a long that was actually worse than the 12 hour non-stop because <laughs> yeah I've been having a little power nap and then my legs completely seized up, trying to get back on the bike and get going again. It was was that the picture quite... like at the end where you're just lying on the kitchen floor? <laughs> yeah, and that was because my, um, my wife and kids came in and uh, <laughs> to witness the finish and to cheer me on at the end. And then I, I didn't realize how broken it was until I got off the bike. I actually felt sick when I got off the bike because when I think it was maybe just from you know standing still and going, oh, I don't have to move my legs anymore. Then my body just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, but but it was you know it was all for you know very very good causes and um, uh, yeah and it, it was one of those things which you know it's just twelve hours or twenty four hours in in my life but the amount of money we raised I'm pleased to say and you know thanks to everyone tuning in already here fantastic um, to all the support we got and, and the funds we raised I think people are sick of me fundraising but. Uh, but hey, it's it's even if it's just for spreading awareness, then that's what it's all about. I, I totally agree with you there. Like, um, it, it's an, an illness that needs to be taken a, a bit more seriously. But um, you are the perfect person to do that. And uh, at the end, we'll we'll link um, you know the websites and stuff, and we'll have a five minute chat. But uh, yeah, thanks for talking about the mental health awareness there, Rog. But as you can see, there's plenty of questions coming on the side. So if you want to scroll up and you know work your way down and answer what you can and yeah enjoy guys because uh yeah roger's a great guy and i'm sure he'll be able to answer your questions so rog take it away absolutely right i'll just get some of these comments up and get answering so hello to everybody it's fantastic to um to see you all here and let's see uh right joe D triple seven. Um, how did the typhoon perform in DACT against the grip and the Rafale? Um, great question. So um, actually, I haven't fought the Rafale in DACT and any dogfighting action, but I have fought the Gripen, and that was I have very very fond memories of that back in the day when I joined Six Squadron at the end of 2013. So I just got onto the uh, typhoon. And it was um, out to Sweden for the Alpine Challenge exercise. And of course, they fly the, the Grippins out there. Um, and um, I, I, with that, I remember, because I think, in fact, yeah, that was my first ever um, DACT, first ever bit of dogfighting. And um, it was, uh, sorry, against a dissimilar type. And one experience, so... Usually what happens is you get the maybe a, a wingman like myself at the time and then a four ship leader um, or an ACL or combat leader and you will be paired against, um, in my case, it would be me against the ACL air combat leader, so the more experienced guy and then um, then my leader at that point against the less experienced guy. So you, you get quite a mismatch of experience, but for my case, of course, fighting the grip in, then we are much more overpowered in the typhoon, so should have a much better chance. And um, although I definitely made a couple of mistakes, um, I remember that during during the during one of the particular fights, it was just amazing the SEP and the specific excess power on the typhoon and the ability to just keep on rating around that corner. So even if you get got yourself in a pickle, then you were um, easily able to. Um, to capitalize and to win anything back that you'd lost. So, um, so a both against the Gripen, um, really the Typhoon will absolutely um, outperform the Gripen. And the Rafale, I mean, it's, it's one thing where the Rafale is um, an excellent aircraft and 
and I do know from uh, you know, from previous experiences uh, from other pilots fighting the Rafale and have done very well. Um, however, I've I've not um, I've not fought against it myself. Um, so moving on, here we go. What's the point of flying through the Mac loop? Um, you know what the Mac loop is is critical because if you can imagine, especially uh, in this day and age, aircraft handling is made quite simple by uh, fly by wire. You know, for example, the the Typhoon, you don't really get much feedback. It is very much relying on the um, what the the green squiggly writing is telling you, and the aircraft won't let you you know go outside of certain envelopes. So when you then go down into low level, it makes flying a lot harder because you've got to stay so aware of, of the environment around you. So not just other aircraft, you, um, to, in a way you can't rely on the radar because um, of ground clutter, so affecting, you know, especially on the typhoon. Um, so therefore you've just got to use your eyes and um, the map loop is in a way very safe because as you probably know a one-way um, uh, system so that you don't actually fly into anyone although I have had an air prox I'll tell you about that in a second but uh, it's which was coming out of the map loop but the point of flying through the map loop is low-level skills and the ability to know that you're going through a one-way system um, so you shouldn't have to worry about any aircraft from the other way, especially when it's so um, popular to fly around there. Um, but it's also absolutely key when you are picking that line. You know, so like a, a race driver having to start at the outside um, um, of the lane and then cut into the middle of the corner. It's very similar to, to when you're flying um, and making sure as well it's a 3D environment. So when you are up against uh, the valley wall, you, you don't want to be you don't want to be doing this and, and obviously flying belly up into the valley wall. So you've got to keep your canopy close to the inside of the corner, and and things like that are absolutely um, critical. I mean, geez, that's hands in the bar already. I should get fined. I'm sure I will. But Safra is a hope. Hopefully, that um, answers your question. And then to the story when, um, if, if to the story of when. Um, uh, yeah, back to the map loop, heading up uh, north. I remember exiting there. I was with, um, in fact, yeah, I was just in, in one aircraft, uh, the Hawk T1, which I was instructing on at the time, and I was sitting in the back, and I had my hand sort of up there, which was my first mistake, but I was doing this mutual instructional trip with a good friend of mine um, in the front, um, and we were training up to be to instruct him so he was flying at the time he was the handling pilot and then just through the glimpse of my eye to the right sort of two o'clock and uh, maybe yeah about one or two o'clock i just saw a, a wing flash like that and it was another hawk but instinctively because i saw it so close and i thought we were going to hit him i just jumped in the controls and pushed down um and and yelled something to the handling pilot as well like down 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 and i just had to jump and push down and um it turns out the only reason that the, the aircraft had moved like that was because he was then avoiding us. And it was actually his um, leader who was behind us in um, battle formation told him to pull up and to avoid. And um, so he simply said, pull up, pull up. And, uh, and I jumped down. So because the only reason I saw him is because I saw this wing flash as he was moving up. And um, so that was a proper scary uh, time. I I remember um, the handling pilot and myself, even though you know we're very good friends, we said nothing for the rest of the flight. Uh, just talked to a traffic landed, got out of the aircraft. It was almost felt like we just had to survive that flight and get back down because yeah, we realized um, that we weren't invincible when you nearly fly into someone. Um, right. Right, Jin Zhang. Yeah, okay, so... Um, Jin so you're, you're talking about yeah general BFM tactics. Well, um, when it comes to the Typhoon, the Typhoon is a rate fighter. So when it comes to F-16, F-18, not so much F-15, but we will capitalize because of our um, specific excess power, SEP, is 
is massive. It means that we are incredibly good rate fighters. Uh, so that's where we will always try and capitalize any fight is doing a, a rate fight. So even if they try to take us into you know high alpha, um, we know that if they go high alpha, then they're going to lose energy off the aircraft. Um, so then we just have to make sure that we're in a position not to die off of whatever they fire at us. Um, we have to make sure that we're in a position to then um, capitalize and rate around and then dominate the fight. Um, so um, it does make it quite interesting when you're fighting you know, um, high alpha fighters who are always going to go for a radius fight. Um, so, it, but it is always on us to drive a rate fight. And as long as we stick to our game, then we should always win. Uh, hopefully that answered the question there, Jin Zhang. And thanks, uh, Mike, MKM, the exploration. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, um, yeah, I, I've also um, lost actually a friend of mine who uh, was a fire pilot to suicide and that really regenerated my motivation, you know, for campaigning against mental health. There's one person who I just, just never, never thought it would happen to so so that's why you know i mean there's obviously a couple of things but um it, it's such a strong motivation to to get that message out there and and to ensure that you know uh, people just think about it and you know i wrote some notes down but what's what's so important is that you know people slow down and and listen because actually in this crazy world with social media and everything that we're caught up caught up in you know especially at the moment when we're living in lockdown and we're just surrounded by social media and all this all this news but it's so important just to slow down and listen and you know at a time like this i'm trying to force myself to stop and call people and, and get in touch with all my friends and make sure you use this time although i've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old so i wouldn't say i'm exactly that quiet um all right so next question uh james the RNF have uh, put a lot of money into mental health and um, from my um, opinion, my perspective is that they're really improving and they're really trying to um, to, to make a difference. Um, <clears throat> now, I think also, you know, it always uh, depends on your own individual confidence to speak up about it. But I do know people who in the Air Force um, in different ranks and trades, but even pilots have spoken up and to, to tell the RAF, the, um, the medical uh, system of their issues with mental health. And they've been, you know, suitably helped and gotten back into a, a good position. So I really think, and I really see it, and it's so heartwarming to see that it's changing and it's, uh, it's all going in the right direction. So yeah, thanks for that question, James. Uh, Jack, Jack Lettingham. Uh, night flying workup. Um, so for uh, so yeah, night flying workup with NVGs. And we don't actually do any work using NVGs on the in the, the basic sort of. Um, oh, sorry, you're referring to fast jet training. So you, you're quite right. And um, to be honest, that's just getting starting to get used to NVGs and wearing them, and um, you know the ability to to fly at night with them, but. Um, uh, but then, of course, as you get into the typhoon world, as you get into uh, even advanced uh, fast jet training, uh, that's when you're starting to use them um, it f for for real in sort of combat environments. Um, now, it has been a while, and uh, they've changed the syllabus for the Hawk T2 as well. So I'm not sure how much they're doing with NVGs on the Hawk T2 before you then get to the typhoon. Um, but straight at the you know, the start of typhoon flying training is very much trying to get exposure to those NVGs um, because, I mean, they're so cumbersome to wear as well. Where you've got the big, heavy helmet and then the NVGs on, on top as well are pretty heavy as well. It does um, create a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of uh, stress in the neck. So, but it's just getting used to it as well and getting used to, you know, you, you don't fly around with them the whole time like this. You're actually putting them up and down on depending on different um, environments that you're fighting in so uh, but good question thanks uh, right I'm just going to scroll down here we go 
thanks everybody for the questions. Keep them coming in. I will do my best to uh, give the answers. If if there is something that I miss or you want a better answer, please do just uh, fire back with another question. Uh, yeah, cool. Good um, answer. Uh, good question, Jin Zhang. So, intercepting the foxhounds and fullbacks. <laughs> well, that was something I'll never forget, I tell you. So, um, that was on Operation Azatize, and we were based in um, uh, just near Tallinn. Um, and we were doing some air policing up there, and some intelligence came in so they decided to launch us to uh, to intercept what they thought was going to be uh, initially just a curl so it was an an26 curl um, that was um, uh, I'm just making sure yeah that's right it was it was an an26 curl that was uh, that we got launched against so very quickly we got out there and intercepted the N26 curl. And then we got follow on intelligence that there were four foxhounds uh, that were coming. And I remember that very clearly. So, I mean, that must have been after uh, probably 25 minutes. I remember we were on the wing of the N26 curl in like six minutes or something. So it was, a, it was such a great team effort to get us up in airborne and intercepting the curl. And, um, and then, yeah, next intelligence right onto the four foxhounds um, and as we were, we had them on our radar and of course, I'm sure you know from the radar, we get um, data which will tell us what speed they're traveling. Uh, so from that, you're going to want to set your intercept speed maybe a touch more than theirs so that will cater for you going around the corner so that you don't get left behind and so you make sure you, you do um, you know, a, a very accurate stern intercept to get you in a, in a good position behind them. And, and I remember just starting the corner and I was like, I'm sure this, this, I set up this geometry just right and it just doesn't seem to be working. And it's because they very quickly accelerated um, up to just underneath the max. So then we had to chase them down. Um, so Foxhounds are, you know, very quick aircraft. And, um, and that was, yeah, that was really interesting. So we intercepted them, came across them, came across beside them and Strangely, with the AN26 curl, those guys were waving and they were, you know, seemed to be really friendly. But the uh, uh, the guys flying the foxhounds, no, they just looked straight ahead. There was no waving uh, to us at all. Um, so we thought, right, that that's cool. Um, let's um, escort them, make sure they they don't um, stray off uh, where they where we want them to go. The whole point of air policing, and then we hauled off, <clears throat> and we got told that there was follow-on intelligence. Um, of uh, potential, uh, well, to be honest, because we're airborne at the time, um, we we had intelligence, let's just say, and we were uh, just going into a cap to endure because looking at the range where we eventually found them on our radar, um, looking at the range of where they were and looking at how much fuel we had before we had to divert, it was going to be close. Um, but obviously everyone always wants to intercept you know something as cool as fullbacks to see them in the flesh was incredible so uh, luckily we managed to have the fuel we did a stern intercept came in behind them um, and we came up uh, across beside them uh, waving taking photos for intelligent purposes doing all the standard procedures and uh, like i said they just looked straight forward they didn't even look at this at all um, and they were all flying around down to Kaliningrad. And, but at that point as well, we actually had to bingo off of the fullbacks and uh, cruise down uh, all the way to, to the base of Ori. Um, so it was, uh, it was an incredible day in the office um, intercepting nine aircraft in a one Um Cool, um, Jack Letting, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you liked the book. Um, it's, um, we've actually just had a whole new bunch uh, produced or a batch printed 750 copies and we've already sold about 100 of those so it's um it's going re really great and you know, we've raised over 20,000 pounds for charity so you know thank you very much and I'm glad you liked it um all right I'm just reading through the uh the questions everything and Jude I'm so pleased that yeah that you now know who you can be honest with 
and uh, and that you find that it's so important to open up and um, to others and obviously like me i open up quite publicly and, and you know i'm very open honest with my story but that doesn't mean everyone has to be like that obviously i'm just one of those people i decided to take that leap and, and do it and i was comfortable with it but i think what you're alluding to is just knowing who is important for you to open up with you know just to, just to know that you can have someone um, that will listen to you um, not be judgmental and you know give you that space to speak so i totally agree with you thank you uh, karen shortland um oh yeah i mean okay so i haven't flown the hawk and the typhoon um start to start there i mean the typhoon has been my absolute dream since i was a kid so ever since i really knew what it was about i remember flying uh, a simulator some sort of arcade game when i was younger i think it was ef 2000 or, or ej 2000 but that would be the engine so i think it was ef 2000 and um, I just got absolutely, you know, addicted, so focused on, on flying that thing. But then the difference between the Hawk and the Typhoon, so I absolutely loved flying the Hawk T1. Uh, it is such a raw aircraft. You really do feel everything. With the Typhoon, it's just so, there's so many computers involved that actually a lot of that can be taken out, a lot of that feeling. And um, so, uh, yeah, it, there's two completely different uh, aircraft. I always say it's like, it's like having or driving a, an Audi R8 compared to driving a kit car. You, um, you know, you the, the feeling of, of what you're getting back from the, the car or the aircraft, that's incredible. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of other fast jets. I mean, I'm, I'm a total aviation geek, always have been, and there's so, air, so many different aircraft that I would love, love to fly. Um, the first one probably, you know, right from the early stages of my career was the Harrier. Um, I would have love to fly that i think you know if anyone says that they wouldn't have then there's something wrong with them because what an aircraft i mean it would bite you from what i've heard you know from friends of mine in the air force who've flown them um, but that is one i would have loved to fly and of course i think of recent times the f-35 i just hear stories about you know what it can do and the, the simulator and, you know, I've seen it up close um, out in Operation Shader when I was out there for the last time. They were operating out there as well. And what a, you know, stunning aircraft. I mean, you know, some would say it's a fat kid in magic pants, um, but it depends how you see it. But to see it up close, what an incredible machine. So, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm just a, a flying geek, I, I would love to fly anything uh, and everything, to be honest. And, uh, I mean, that takes me down the Spitfire. So if there's any... Uh, any uh, takers out there, I would love to fly the uh, the, um, the Spitfire or the Hurricane, obviously. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, Jared Goy. Uh, reduced capability at high altitudes. Um, I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't say so, no, because of the um, Delta Wing. The whole point of the Delta Wing is for that you know, supersonic environment and ability um, uh, up at high level as well. So actually, um, at high altitude, I think it performs incredibly well because, once again, of the specific excess power. You know, um, so to be honest, I don't think, I think like all aircraft, they will uh, reduce in capability as, as you get higher up because of the lower air density. So um, I don't know if there's any specific facts about that when you compare it against different aircraft type, I wouldn't know, um, or I'm, I'm not personally sure. Um, but to be honest, if the you know, question is, does it have reduced capability at high altitudes? Well, it does, but if you compare it against you know, other fast jets, then I'm not sure if it does actually um, you know, reduce at a higher rate. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your uh, question, but thanks, Jared. Jared. And Jin Zhang, no, unfortunately not. I uh, had some friend, friends of mine who managed to uh, fight the flanker. Uh, the fulcrum I've come up against, but not in uh, dogfighting. It was more of a um, DCA type of thing. So we did come up close, but we didn't actually get into any DACT. And, and the F-22, no, but I have heard there's some um, you know, good stories of the typhoon fighting the F-22 and doing very well. 
Um, however, there's, you know, as you know, pros and cons doesn't always come down to DACT, especially not in the, the war that we think, you know, in, in the future would be fought. Um, it's all about the sense. And yes, uh, Jenna have actually flown the Typhoon in the Mac loop. And yeah, so the common low level experience uh, against the Hawk, I think just back to what I was saying before, the the Typhoon has got a different feel to it. You know, it's not as if it's got a completely lack of feel, but the Hawk definitely felt everything, uh, you know, every bit of sort of tickle underneath the wing. Um, but then at the same time with the Typhoon, it's more because of the Delta wing, you've got like a you got um, buffeting going on underneath the, the wing almost all the time. Um, so that that means that you're getting sort of bits and bobs of, of feedback. Um, but it really just depends. So actually, I can say that the low level experience though, because of the, the suite of information that you're getting compared to the Hawk that had no computers apart from a bolt-on, um, effectively a tom-tom. And that's what we had back then. Um, with the typhoon, with its moving map and everything, so you just felt, you know, comfortable. You had so much more SA. So then that, to be honest, gave you um, a, a lot more of a comfortable feeling flying at the level as well. And knowing also that in the typhoon you had so much power that if you ever got caught in, uh, you know, in a predicament where maybe the weather comes in and you need to do a low level abort, then you can just get out of anything anywhere because of the amount of power that it has. Hey, Harry. Hey, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for your question uh, about the application process and selection for the RAF. You know, I found it a really uh, fun time because when you get down there and you spend a couple of days, I'm, I'm talking about more of OASC down at Cranwell, and you get to then hang out with these people that are alive. You know, they think in the same way, you get to know them better, you get to, to meet these really ambitious people. Um, you know, you find yourself going, oh, I think that person's better than me, they're probably going to get picked before I do. Um, but that, of course, is natural. Uh, and I do just remember thinking, well, I'm just going to try and enjoy this and have some fun and see where it gets me and just try and project, you know, an attitude which, which is going to show to them that I'll never give up. Um, so I, I found it stressful, but I found it really enjoyable and I met some really good people that I'm still in touch with today from that whole process, you know, and getting through into officer training. And then to be honest, it hasn't stopped. I mean, that's why I love the Air Force, the camaraderie, the people you meet and the experiences you go through. That really is what it's all about. Hey, uh, sorry, I'm just... Um... <laughs> What is the Typhoon's maximum G onset rate? That's a good question, and I do not have the answer for that. Um, however, I will comment to say that. Uh, oh, sorry, that's from uh, BAT21. Um, it is incredible how good an aircraft the Typhoon is, where you can come into a merge and then literally not have to worry about any of the, um, of the aircraft and its uh, you, you're not going to overstress uh, the aircraft because it just won't let you. You know, so the fact that you can roll in, um, you know, at uh, a speed which is going to give you the, the best rate performance, uh, or at least lead down to that um, with a corner speed initially, and just being able to backstick and uh, it hurts, um, and an aircraft will just stabilise there. You know, so straight up to 9G, it is uh, fantastic. Um, um, I'm just flicking through all the questions. Thank you very much for all the questions, guys. Okay, so... Right, um, someone asked, I'll try and go through them as best I can uh, in order. So, Jim, uh, intercepting bears, 
Um, yeah, it is true that the counter rotating props are really loud, which is quite um, strange to be honest. When you're in your cockpit going, you know, potentially three, four hundred miles an hour, and then you can actually hear their props. And um, so, yeah, and I have one, um, you know, favourite story, which is when we moved QRA from Cook Reaction Alert from Lukers up to Lossiemouth and uh, six board moved up with it and we were um, there to set up uh, QRA up at Lossiemouth. So I actually was on the first scramble, which was against a couple of bears uh, from RF Lossiemouth. And because of that, the powers that be wanted to make sure that they got some good photos of us intercepting uh, these TU-95 bears. So as we came across, um, because I think because, let's just say it's a bit, little bit different to our SOP, but because there's two of us nice and close beside then the bear, um, they were all, the, the guys in the bear uh, were waving and the guy in the, the tail gunner or the guy in the, you know, that position had a big difficult one and a big zoom lens on his camera. So he was taking photos and waving and I was waving back. And then on the top of one of the variants of the bear, um, I think this was the Juliet, there was like a little um, sort of uh, perspex dome and I just saw this uh, this guy um, sort of come up the top, give me a big smile, a uh, wave, and then he just got his iPad up and I just saw this iPad, which I guess was recording, you know, us two flying, flying alongside. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was some, you know, incredible memories. And then go on what would have been uh, maybe three months later, I think, and we got scrambled at um, three in the morning uh, against a couple of blackjacks uh, with an IL-76, sorry, IL-78 Midas as well. And uh, that was um, that was quite incredible because it, it was at that time pitch black and it, there was hardly any moon as well. Then it meant, um, you know, looking through the NVGs and just seeing this, this blackjack at night, um, that was, yeah, that was quite something. Um, something I'll never forget, that's for sure. Uh, Jack, yeah, low level in the Lake District. To be honest, the typhoon, when it comes to the level, especially these days, we don't do so much. It's a very important skill. Um, if we have to deal with any low, slow uh, type aircraft on QRA, um, which would mean, as it sounds, low in the level and, and low speed, then we need to be able to do that. And um, we can practice that in the sim, but we need to be able to do it for real as well. Um, and that's why it's so important um, that we do get down to low level. But, you know, it's not like in, when I was back in the day in the hot T1, where we'd just be screaming around uh, all of Wales, go up to lake, uh, the, the lakes. Um, then we, we don't really do so much of that because a lot of the stuff that we do in the typhoon is uh, medium level. Uh, so unfortunately, because I do love a good bit of low level, we don't do so much. I have done a couple of days down the lakes um, and it is absolutely stunning down there. And then the Spade Adam, um, the EW facility, yeah, it is good. And I've used that quite a few times actually over my career, uh, you know, about seven years in the, on the Typhoon front line. And yeah, fantastic facility. Um, but there's just quite a lot of things that we're doing right now. So having to juggle um, all of these different disciplines, um, which means that we, we don't go there as much as we'd like to, but yeah, good, good question. Hey, Harry, um, Kirby. Yeah, I do still cycle. Absolutely love it. Uh, there is an RAF cycling team. And you know what? There's all sorts when it comes to cycling opportunities. Um, they, they really do um, uh, have it all when it comes to sports. Very supportive and trying to you know get as much out there for people to do adventure training. But at the same time as well, I find that you can, um, you can find that you're trying to... Um, uh, what I'm trying to say that you can try and set up these opportunities yourself, you know, so if you go on to uh, a squadron, you end up working um, uh, for, from, uh, for a different trades in the Air Force, then as long as you get a group of people who want to go out cycling, then, you know, you'll always get that. Um, it's all about, you know, adventure training and, and uh, force development. And, you know, that's so important. So something that they capitalize on as well. Uh, right, I will try and scroll down and, and try and see. Uh, so, Tony S, <laughs> thanks for the question. Biggest thrill, flying typhoon low level or downhill skiing? That is a really good question because 
there are similarities, but then at the same time, it's completely different. So flying a typhoon, it almost feels like an arcade. So when you're at low level, you you feel the speed, you know, like say the, the valley walls rushing by, but you're also so focused on, on what's next and the, the lines you're taking and, and, and what's going on, if there's any aircraft monitoring the radar, you know, you all, the all sorts of things that you're having to stay on top of. So actually you almost become quite but full priorities of what you're doing. Um, with downhill skiing, it's very raw because, you know, we would wear just a Lycra suit and just with a, a thin sort of uh, long john roll neck underneath and that was it. So it meant that every time you like hit a gate going 100 miles an hour, which we would, you know, occasionally hit in the races, um, you, would, you would feel that it would hurt. And if you ever went down, you would know that you're not invincible and you're not in an arcade. Um, and of course, you would never want to go down in Typhoon, but I went down plenty of times down on skiing. You know, most people did. Um, but there are a lot of similarities, but it's just that, um, that feeling of speed that changes. You know, so in a Typhoon, actually, you don't often get that feeling of speed. Even if you're going Mach 1.8, it's only if you're you know, above a cloud layer or, or something that you'll get that, that ground rush. But with skiing, um, the fastest I got clocked was just over 100 miles per hour. And that was just what a rush. You know, the, um, I mean, you're so focused on, on staying upright, but, uh, but what a rush. But thanks, Tony. Um, LZ, from a flying perspective, Typhoon's main strengths and weaknesses. Um, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, there's so many advances and a, a lot of people refer to the Typhoon as a, a four and a half, a generation four and a half. You know, not like the fifth gen F-35, F-22, but at the same time, it really has come to fruition. So when I started on the Typhoon, it was um, touted as a, a multi-role fighter. And it was, but it really hadn't proven itself in, in that. And actually, the systems were quite clunky um, when it comes to, you know, manipulating the weapon system. But then over the time, and since I've been in, you know, now we're uh, Paveway 4, Brimstone, Storm Shadow, and then obviously air-to-air -air stuff, uh, Meteor, and of course AMRAM and ASRAM. And, you know, that suite, and to be able to quickly access any of those um, weapon systems and, and, you know, use them very easily, it really is incredible how far the Typhoon has come. Um, I mean, the weaknesses is, to be honest, uh, when it comes to comparing it, because actually it's very strong for, for what it is as, let's call it a 4.5 gen fighter. Um, but weaknesses, you know, there's a few things where it could improve on. And, you know, the RAF are very much looking into that. Uh, things like having um, um, an E-scan radar rather than the, the Captor M-scan radar that it's got at the moment. Um, but, you know, that is in the future. And I think that is going to be fantastic as well. Uh, one thing which is well known is flying at night. Uh, currently, we have to wear an older helmet. So if you know, the HMSS is the helmet of choice for the day, which is it's this thing that's uh, specifically met. I think they cost about £65,000. Um, mind you, that's not even compared to F-35, which is hundreds of thousands, I think. Uh, but it's incredible what you get through this helmet and the SA that you have, because you can just look around and it'll give you a symbology. It's like a, you know, a HUD that's always in, in your and in your helmet visor, projected onto your helmet visor. So it really is fantastic. But uh, we don't use that at night uh, because of the NVGs. And um, so that's going to be a, a good bit um, you know, looking forward where we can get the night helmet, uh, sorry, like a night version of the HMSS with the NVGs incorporated. So that would be fantastic. That is definitely a weakness. Um, is it what are recruit, recruiters looking for in the first interviews for our officers I think attitude and um, don't ever think that you have to get everything correct I certainly didn't um, I remember when I was going through the process and I had to say I don't know a hundred times because it just didn't you know I really did try my best going into it interview. it was as if I was unprepared 
But at the same same time, you've got to just show them that you are willing to learn and you've got great attitudes and you want it and you want it badly. I think that is what is absolutely key, and especially in that first instance. Um, because, but but also to enjoy yourself. You know, if you go in there rigid and scared um, and kind of worried about how you're coming across, then you, you can be like that as well because you're not going to be yourself. Um, I really hope that helps. And uh, if you're going for it, then um, I hope that I hope that small piece of advice helps. Um, so uh, Dieter, the uh, the teapot. So uh, the LDP. Um, what we've got the the lightning laser designator pod, and so we have three screens in the cockpit, and we can move that uh, from wherever we want. And actually, we often got um, into the habit of keeping it right in the middle because, uh, as in, in box screen, which is sort of just in front of the control column, um, it meant that you could see, it and you're not always sort of lean like that, especially when you know I've done, like I said, three tours of Operation Shader, and with that, it means if you're, you know, going around in a circle the whole time, because you know we spend um, in, a, in a close air support in, in the wheel, um, which means that we can always be looking into an area with the pod, and if you're always sort of looking to the side, um, so that's one thing that we always keep it um, in in one screen. But that's complete preference, and it's the beauty of the Typhoon, where you can just move it around as you wish. Um, but then we have a uh, sort of almost like a a nipple mouse, I'm sure it's got a technical term, which is on the throttle, um, and that is just with your forefinger to control it. Um, can be quite tricky, and trust me, I've had to do um, uh, a, a couple of Paveway 4 attacks and one uh, Paveway 4 moving attack against a uh, Toyota Hilux doing about 50 miles per hour, and that was quite tricky with this uh, forefinger having to make sure that the weapon system was aimed correctly. Uh, let, here we go. Who have I not um, answered any questions for yet? Space streams. Yes, I've had quite a few emergencies in the typhoon actually, um, and you know, luckily got away unscathed uh, without too many major stories, but definitely um, some tricky situations which have you know had to deal with. So uh, one, one which sort of tickles me, and, and I'll, I'll never forget. It, which was doing, like as I mentioned previously, the the moving the aircraft. So six were moving from RF Lukers up to RF Lossiemouth, and we decided, uh, or the the boss decided, we were going to do um, a display sort of formation in the shape of a six, um, which was really cool. And, and um, I can share some photos afterwards. Um, and I was very fortunate to be part of that. You know, they tried to get most of the pilots involved. Um, but there was only you know so many spots available. So um, as we were then, uh, so relocating the aircraft up, set up for the formation. We were out over the out to the east over the North Sea. We got a whip to make sure that we're looking good in six, and then we fly over the uh, airfield in the six formation before we then transit up to Lossiemouth and do the same. And literally, just as we are crossing over the the beginning of the runway, um, the the threshold of the runway, my aircraft just starts spewing fuel out the back. And so it's coming out of the top fin, and it's it's venting out the top fin, and it's actually covering the aircraft in the back. Luckily, um, it, it was fine. The airflow was was taking the fuel off, and but they started telling me, hey. Um, I think I was number three, number two, maybe. Uh, you've got a leak, you've got a leak. And um, I think at that point, it was a case of um, I just had to stay with it, you know, in the formation because at, at the time, there wasn't really much I could do. And it turned out to be a, a dodgy a valve in the system um, that, un unfortunately, I, I had to just turn around and I think I had to land at Lucas at that point, you know, rather than go all the way up to Lossiemouth. So I wasn't able to be part of the fly past up at Lossiemouth. And then, but we had a spare airborne who was able to stunt in for for me. Um, so I was very lucky that, to be honest, was, you know, very lucky to just get away with it. And had the same uh, issue. Um, I've had it three times in total. Um, they've now looked at this, this uh, dodgy valve because they've had a, a few spates of this across the Typhoon Force and it's um, now, I'm glad to say, fixed. And, but I have had it when I was 
coming out of uh, Jordan and uh, transiting through Jordan into Iraq. And then we were, we'd had been on a long transit from Akrotiri, from Cyprus. So we had to meet up with the tanker to get fuel. And then, of course, Oslo, we're, we're not too far away from the tanker, but the tanker's got some issues. Um, and I think he was furnishing some other aircraft before they could then come and help us. So we were tight on gas anyway, and then I started venting fuel out the fin. Um, so that was quite a tricky day in the office. Um, it turned out we didn't actually have to divert, um, but it was, it was very, very close. So yeah, I had quite a few emergencies, and it's always the, the fuel ones are probably the scariest because uh, fuel is life in these things. And when you go into max reheat, uh, then that fuel disappears very, very quickly. All right, so yeah, go for it. Absolutely, right. Have a look. There's some good questions here. Thank you so much, guys. I'm really sorry that I couldn't rattle through them and uh, answer you know, everything you could. Um, okay, right, here we go. That's a really good question. Where is it? Yeah, uh, so this, you said, hi Roger, in the time you've been advocating for mental health, has there been a culture change within the RAF regarding mental health? And what surprised you in your work within the service? Uh, it's a really good question and there absolutely has been uh, a culture change. I'm, I'm really, you know, happy over the moon to report. Um, and I, sorry, and what has surprised you in your work within the service? Um, you know, so when it comes to mental health and, you know, one of the, the biggest things that I've seen from the skiing world as well into the flying world is that there's almost like people are wearing this mask, you know, this this cover up of, of who they are. You know, like, oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, no, that's that's not an issue. Oh, no, that, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. But then, you know, from doing the job um, as a fighter pilot, out on operation shader and you know people having to draw weapons and do the nasty side of the work um, and you know and, and knowing that they've taken someone's life and then having to deal with that that is that's quite something that people have you know dealt with in the Air Force do, doing the fighter the job of a fighter pilot for a long time but it's how people then deal with that and react to it and I, and I think you know that is across the services where um, you know you get put in these positions and you start off like me I just want to fly I just want to fly fighter jets you know I just want to fly something fast and pointy and you know do the best I could and then when you come across into uh, Operation Shader and dropping bombs on people then it, it changes your perspective and you start to realize that oh this is you know it's a lot of power but also the you start to ask why and also you, I, I've seen now from experience of the different people reacting in different ways you know some people want to want to talk about it and they want to sort of whoop and holler and say yeah do you see that and this and because that's the way they cope with it is talking about it and expressing it almost like an extrovert way but then you get some people who would would just completely shy away and don't want to talk about it it's not as if they were shame ashamed or embarrassed about what they were doing they most likely, and a lot of people I've worked with, you know, feel very proud about what they're doing and know that it's the right thing. And myself included that, you know, I, I feel proud of what I've had the opportunity to do. And I feel very lucky and fortunate I've had the opportunity to do it. But, you know, to answer your question, I've seen from even the first time I went Operation Shader in 2016 to the last time, uh, which was 19, um, you know, people start to talk about these things more and talk about how it's affected them and then share that, you know, the, the, the good, the, the highs and the lows. And I've seen that rattle around the different squadrons. Um, and I'd like to think that that has is, is really gone far and wide throughout the entire Air Force. You know, I can really only talk about, you know, my squadron because that's when you get close to people and you understand and, and they will open up to you. 
And I've really seen that and I've, I've had different people, I mean, probably more likely because I've been mental health campaigning and they know that I've been open and honest myself. So they feel like they can be open and honest to me. But I think that's great. And I think even if that's one people or, you know, quite a few people have come to me with that and they felt like they can open up to me, then that's fantastic. But I also know that has been the case, you know, for quite a few people uh, in the Air Force and it is spreading um, Air Force wide. So thank you very much for that question. Rog, what a great way to end and a great segment into our next bit uh, while we finish up. But uh, thank you very much for your time. I mean, some great answers there and hopefully that's helped a lot of people out there. But uh, yeah, where can we find the book and yourself online? Yeah, sure. So I've got um, a few different avenues, but really, if people want to, to buy the book uh, in hard copy, then I'm really pleased to say that Envoy Group um, a company who have actually sponsored uh, uh, getting a, a new batch printed, so 750 copies. Um, so, um, so, so pleased with them supporting, you know, what we're doing. Um, so it means we've got loads of hard copies um, now available. So you can um, nip onto my Facebook page, which, which is facebook.com uh, forward slash speed of sound 2016. Uh, and then on there, just send me a, uh, a message, and um, and then I'll I'll tell you, you know talk through how to get a book. But all the money does go to charity, especially because this company paid Envoy Group paid for the production. Then every penny, you just go into uh, my uh, Virgin Money Giving site, and then you just contribute or donate to Heads Together, uh, and then send me a message with your address, and we'll get one in the post. Uh, it's myself and Don that do it ourselves and actually send the books out. Uh, if you would like the, um, the the book in a Kindle version, then you can actually just go into Amazon.co.uk and then search for Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, and it'll tell, um, and, and yeah, you'll, you'll find the Kindle ver version on there. Um, I am on Instagram as well. I've, I've started to try and um, get more use of that. Um, Twitter, I just can't cope with. <laughs> but that's me. Um, but I do, I do a little bit on Twitter as well. But I can't, I can't keep up with it's like one-year-old, three-year-old Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, so it's mainly Facebook, like I said, and then Instagram, which is Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind. Um, and yeah, it's it's great. Thank you so much to everyone for the questions, and please do get in touch uh, if you have any questions about flying-related or mental health-related. I'm more than happy to help work. Yeah, because I think, like, Rod, you saw all the questions coming in there. Like, we couldn't even get halfway through. But hopefully, maybe we can get you on again for another Q&A in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in this current environment, you know, I'm uh, I'm pretty much under house arrest uh, at, at the moment. I'm uh, out in Saudi Arabia on my, in, in my new job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but saying that, it, it doesn't matter. Honestly, when I get the boys down to, to sleep, uh, then it means that I've got some time chat in the evening um, and I'm more than happy. And it's, it's so nice to see that there's some fantastic questions, you know, about flying, but also about mental health as well. Um, because, you know, that, like I said to you before, right at the beginning, back in 2016, yeah. you know, I really find that it's so important. And that's the one reason I do this. It's because, you know, I know from these experiences that it's so important to, for people to talk up and if, if I have the opportunity and thank you Mike for giving me the opportunity um, you know it's, it's been my pleasure to be here oh it's my pleasure and I think like yeah I think like coming from a person like you you know like uh, high up in the RAF you're a typhoon pilot it, it kind of like gives people you know like hope and stuff if you know like they're not doing so well in their life or whatever like for reason they can think like you know, like anything's possible and, you know, helps out there. So I think you're a great advocate for mental health. So thank you for the whole community. No, no, well, uh, thank you very much. And, you know, I'm, that's exactly what, you know, I'm trying to get the message across. You know, I, like I, I sit here, I've got nine pins and a, and a plate in my left leg. And then I've got four metal coils in my face, you know, yeah. so leg from a skiing accident and then my face is from a mountain biking crash. Um, and you know, obviously, you know how I feel about mental health and, yeah. and my backstory with that. But, but I, I do honestly feel like you know I've had some um, pretty rubbish stuff happen to me. But at the same time, it's given me that you know that ability to look at stuff and go, well, what can I do? I'm just going to try my best. And that comes with everything. I think you know it, it comes with everything like 
getting back on my leg, I had so many people tell me that I wouldn't be able to, to ski race again. I wouldn't be able to ski again. In fact, the surgeon told me I'd always walk with a limp. And then the team doctor said, yeah, you're not going to be able to ski again. But it's incredible what you know the, the mind does. I, I, don't th- I don't think it's me. I know it's not me being anything special. It's just having good people around me, a support network saying you can do it, you can do it, keep on trying. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's so important to have people who have gone through those experiences. I don't wish it on anybody. I don't want anyone to have metal work in of the course, body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's the same with, you know, everything that's happened with, um, you know, my mom that it, it turns out, um, you know, it's something that it has battered and bruised me personally and the family and it affects me in lots of different ways but I want to be open and honest about that and I know that I'm, I'm constantly dealing with that and trying to be a better person um, and hopefully to share that with people to go uh, you know like as you say like being in the job I have and, and doing the things I've done some people put me on a pedestal um, and I really don't like that because we're just all human beings muddling through this world trying our best as long as you try your best yeah. and I, but I think when, when bad things happen if you talk about them, share them, then actually people will help. Will, will people will glean from you know my experiences, and they will get they will get um, um, comfort from that, knowing that they can actually get through the other side. So so yeah, uh, hopefully um, that's my short my long answer of, of completely agreeing with you. Like I said at, right at the beginning, I just want to help people, and this is what I can do within my gift, you know, at the moment. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, and I think it's so important. And but I'm 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 just very grateful for what I have. You know, like I, I could say that there's definitely been a bit of luck um, along the way, but mm-hmm. from having you know people around me um, and meeting you know lots of great people, then um, that's what makes it all worthwhile being able to share it. So, but so thanks for giving me this opportunity to share it.